In this recording, I will cover Chapter 55, Periodontics. In this lecture, we will talk about the parts of periodontal charting, the systemic conditions that influence periodontal treatment, and the areas reviewed for periodontal concerns. We also will describe the early signs of periodontal disease and dental conditions that contribute to periodontal disease. We'll look at instruments that are used in periodontal therapy. We'll also talk about non-surgical treatments, the types of periodontal surgery and periodontal surgical dressings. We'll discuss hand scaling versus ultrasonic scaling, including the, the advantages of each and the indications and contraindications for the use of the ultrasonic scaler. Finally, we will discuss lasers versus conventional surgical techniques. Periodontics is the dental specialty involved in the diagnosis and treatment of diseases of the supporting tissues. As a dental assistant in a periodontal office, you'll need to understand periodontal diseases and the instruments and procedures that are done in a periodontal office. You also will assist with periodontal charting and surgeries and providing home care instructions to the patient. General dentists and periodontists collaborate in the care and treatment of patients with periodontal diseases. Generally, the general dentist will provide for the routine dental care while the periodontist provides treatment and maintenance of the periodontal diseases for the patient. The staff in both the general dentist and periodontist offices must co coordinate the periodontal maintenance therapy to ensure comprehensive care for the patient. Maintenance appointments are critical. There are early warning signs of periodontal disease. These include changes in color, size, shape, and texture of the gingiva, inflammation, bleeding, evidence of pus, and the development of periodontal pockets. Bacteria in the periodontal pockets will multiply, and if left untreated, the disease will progress until the tooth is ultimately lost to periodontal disease. A periodontal examination includes many things. It includes a complete medical and dental history. Remember that we talked about last week about the systemic leak to periodontal disease? So it's very important to note any systemic conditions that a patient might have. Radiographs, especially bite wings, will help the periodontist see any damage to the periodontal structures. Then the periodontist will do a complete exam of the teeth and tissues and supporting structures. During this exam, a periodontal chart will be created, which includes pocket readings, furcations, points at which the roots of a multi-root tooth diverge, tooth mobility, existence of pus, and gingival recession. You will need to make sure that you update the medical and dental history for the patient. Ask the patient whether he or she has experienced any changes since the last visit and, up, and make a record of any such changes, including HIV, diabetes, bleeding gums, and loose teeth. It is normal for teeth to have a slight amount of movement. However, excessive mobility can be a sign of periodontal disease. Mobility is recorded um, with the use of the following scale. Zero equals normal, one equals slight mobility, two equals mo moderate mobility, three equals extreme mobility. This picture shows uh, how the periodontist would check for mobility. Another part of the periodontal examination includes assessing the amount of plaque and calculus that is present, any changes in the gums, and any bleeding. The periodontist also will assess how much bone loss there is. Finally, he or she will look for periodontal pockets. So when the periodontist is checking for periodontal pockets, he or she uses a periodontal probe. 
A periodontal pocket becomes evident when the gingival sulcus, which is the natural space between the surface of the tooth and the gum tissue, become deeper than normal. The periodontal probe measures how much epithelial attachment has been lost. The greater the depth of the periodontal pocket, the greater the loss of epithelial attachment in bone. This equates to more serious periodontal disease. A pocket reading of less than 3 millimeters is considered normal. Anything above 3 millimeters is, is not normal and is a sign of more serious periodontal disease. The periodontist also looks for signs of bleeding. This is called the bleeding index. It is the amount of bleeding observed during probing. Several different systems of recording bleeding scores are used. Each system is based on the principle that healthy gingiva does not bleed. Occlusal trauma does not cause periodontal pocket formation, but it can cause tooth mobility, destruction of bone, migration of teeth, and temporal mandibular joint pain. The accuracy of radiographs is critical in the diagnosis of periodontal disease. Bite wings can accurately show bone height along the root surface, if the radiograph shows low bone height, this is a sign of periodontal disease. There are many specialized instruments used by the periodontist and dental hygienist to remove calculus and smooth root surfaces, measure periodontal pockets, and perform, perform periodontal surgery. It is important to note that in Texas, only the dentist and registered dental hygienist can remove calculus. Periodontal probes may be metal or plastic. They are used to locate and measure the depth of the periodontal pockets. They are tapered to fit into the sulcus with a rounded or flat tip. The measurements are calculated in millimeters and six measurements are taken around the tooth. The buckle, distobuckle, distolingual, lingual, mesial buccal, and mesial lingual. Periodontal explorers are used to locate deposits of supragingival and subgingival calculus and to provide tactile information about the roughness or smoothness of root surfaces. There are many styles of periodontal probes. They are longer and more curved than explorers use for caries detection. Their working ends are fine, thin, and easily adapt to root surfaces. They also are long enough in they also are long enough to reach the base of deep pockets and furcations. There are many scalers that are used in periodontics. The sickle scalers are the most common, and they are used primarily to remove supragingival calculus. Chisel and hole scalers and files are less frequently used. The chisel scaler removes supragingival calculus in the contact areas of the anterior teeth. Hose scalers are used to remove heavy supragingival calculus, especially on the buccal and lingual surfaces of the posterior teeth. Files are used to crush or fracture extremely heavy calculus. Curettes are used to remove subgingival calculus to smooth um, rough root surfaces and remove the diseased tissue lining of the periodontal pockets. A curette has a rounded end, unlike a scalar which has a pointed end. The two Basic types of curettes are the Universal and Gracie. Universal curettes are designed to adapt to all tooth surfaces. They have two cutting edges. The Gracie curette has one cutting edge and it is used for specific tooth surfaces, such as the mesial and distal. The most common used knife in periodontal surgery is the Kirkland knife. 
It is usually double-ended with kidney-shaped blades. The Orban knife is used to remove tissue from the interdental areas. It has a spear-like shape and has cutting edges on both sides of the blade. Periotomes are used to cut periodontal ligaments during tooth extractions. Pocket markers are similar in appearance to cotton pliers. However, one tip is smooth and straight and the other tip is sharp and is bent at a right angle. The smooth tip is inserted at the base of the pocket. When pressure is applied to the pocket marker, the sharp tip makes small perforations in the gingiva. These perforations, called bleeding points, are used to mark the area for an incision on the gingiva. The ultrasonic scaler provides rapid calculus removal and reduces hand fatigue. It works by converting very high frequency sound waves into mechanical energy in the form of extremely rap rapid vibrations, usually uh, 20,000 to 40,000 cycles per second. And this is at the tip of the instrument. A spray of water at the tip prevents the buildup of heat and continuously flushes debris and bacteria from the base of the pocket. Because of the spray of the water at the tip, there is a large amount of potentially contaminated aerosol spray. Therefore, the dental assistant should be available to assist with the HVE to minimize aerosol con contamination. Indications for the use of the ultrasonic scaler include removal of supragingival calculus and difficult stains, removal of subgingival calculus, plaque and endotoxins from the root surfaces, cleaning of the furcation areas, removal of deposits before periodontal surgery, removal of endodontic orthodontic uh, cements, and removal of overhanging margins of restorations. Contraindications to use of an ultrasonic scaler include patients with known communicable diseases that can be transmitted via aerosols, such as TB or COVID-19, immunocompromised patients, patients with a history of respiratory problems, patients with swallowing difficulties, patients with a severe gag reflex, and patients with a pacemaker. And the other oral conditions um, that contraindicate using uh, ultrasonic scalers include demineralized areas. Um, the ultrasonic can remove, can remove the areas of remineralization that begin to cover the demineralization. Um, exposed dentin areas, um, the tooth structure can be removed and this can result in tooth sensitivity. Um, areas around the restoration, um, some restorative materials can be damaged by the ultrasonic vibration. Um, titanium implant abutments. Um, the ultrasonic can damage the titanium uh, surface unless there's a special plastic sheath used to cover the tip. If there are narrow uh, periodontal pockets, the tip of the ultrasonic will not fit uh, to do the cleaning. The use of ultrasonic scalers is contraindicated on primary and newly erupted permanent teeth. These teeth may be sensitive to ultrasonic vibrations. Vibrations and heat also may damage the pulp tissue. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of treatments and surgeries uh, for periodontal disease. Dental prophylaxis is a periodontal procedure that completely removes calculus, soft deposits, plaque, and stains from all the supragingival and unattached subgingival tooth surfaces. Dentists and dental hygienists are the only members of the dental health team who are licensed to perform this procedure. Dental prophylaxis 
also is the primary treatment for gingivitis. Scaling and root planing are a non-surgical technique done as a part of a periodontal debridement. The goal of debridement is to remove deposits on the tooth and reduce the bio burden within the pocket, including necrotic or dead tissue. Sometimes gingival curatage, another surgical technique may be used. Okay, let's talk about scaling. During scaling, scaling, scalers are used to remove supragingival calculus, and curettes are used to remove both supragingival and subgingival calculus. Some areas on the root surface may remain rough after calculus removal. This is because the cementum, that calcified substance covering the root of the tooth, has become necrotic or dead or because the scaling has produced um, grooves and scratches in the cementum. Root planing is done after scaling and it removes any remaining particles of calculus and necrotic or dead cementum embedded in the root surface. After root planing, the surfaces of the tooth are smooth and glass-like. The benefits of root planing is that the smooth root surface resist, resists new calculus formation and are easier for the patient to keep clean. In addition to scaling and root planing, patients may require gingival curatage, also referred to as subgingival curatage. Gingival curatage is the scraping of the gingival lining of a periodontal pocket. This is, formed, this is performed to remove necrotic or dead tissue from the pocket wall. The periodontist may describe antimicrobial and antibiotic, antibiotics during the periodontal treatment. Tetracycline is a particularly useful antibiotic, but it does have an adverse effect in that it interferes with the effectiveness of birth control pills. It is important to inform female patients about this side effect. Penicillin has proven to be less effective because of the many pathogens um, from periodontal disease have become resistant to it. Fluoride mouth rinses have been shown to reduce bleeding by delaying bacterial growth in the periodontal pockets. Chlorhexidine rinses um, are a highly effective antimicrobial therapy to reduce plaque and gingivitis. However, it can cause some temporary brown staining on the teeth, tongue, and resin restorations. There are many new um, methods that can now be used to apply antibiotics directly into the periodontal pockets. One method includes using a syringe to insert the dissolvable materials, such as the gel, into the pockets. Um, and this is the picture um, in the bottom right corner. Another technique is a dissolvable chip that is inserted into deep pockets that releases chlorhexidine. And that is this picture here at the top right. Now that we've talked about non-surgical procedures, let's talk about surgical periodontal treatment. Surgery is recommended only when non-surgical intervention has failed. There are some advantages and disadvantages to surgical treatment. The primary advantage of surgery is that it allows one to gain access to the root surface by removing or lifting the gingival tissues. When the root surfaces are exposed, they can be scaled and root plane more easily and thoroughly. It also makes it easier for the patient to clean areas that are difficult to reach. 
The disadvantages include the patient's health status and age, as well as limitations of the procedures. From the patient perspective, the disadvantages usually include time, cost, aesthetics, and discomfort. As the dental assistant, you usually have developed a good rapport with the patient, which puts you in a unique position to discuss these concerns with the patient. The amount of bone remaining around a tooth is, important, is an important consideration in the decision to perform surgery. The dentist may take a wait and see approach if there is large amounts of bone around a tooth. This wait and see approach can postpone or avo avoid surgery. When this approach is taken, the patient must practice excellent home care and routine dental care. If the amount of bone is already reduced, delaying surgery may drastically reduce the chances of saving the tooth. So in picture A, you can see there are is seven millimeters of um, bone. In picture B, there's five millimeters. Notice that the pockets are getting deeper. And then in picture C, there's only two um, millimeters of bone and the pockets are very deep. Okay, so let's talk about um, one of the types of surgery. Excisional surgery is a type of surgery that removes excess tissue. It is the most rapid method to reduce periodontal pockets. Common types of excisional sur surgery are gingivectomy and gingioplasty. A gingivectomy removes diseased gingival tissue. It is performed when it is necessary to reduce the depth of the periodontal pocket and when fibrous gingival tissue must be removed. It also involves making bleeding points and removing the gingival tissues. Recently, the use of dental lasers have become very popular um, in gingivectomies. Um, the best thing about it is after healing, it's easier for the patient to clean an area in which the pockets have been reduced. Now let's talk about gingivoplasty. Gingivoplasty involves the surgical reshaping and contouring of the gingival tissues. Um, during gingivoplasty, um, the gingiva are recontoured um, using the periodontal knives, a rotary diamond burr, cur curettes, and surgical scissors. Gingival margins are also thinned and are giving, given scalloped edges. On this slide, picture A illustrates enlarged gingiva. Picture B shows the initial incision using the Kirkland knife. Picture C shows interproximal tissue being removed with the Orban knife. And picture D shows the gingivoplasty being performed with tissue nippers. On this slide, picture E shows the gingioplasty being performed using a round diamond burr. Uh, picture F shows the completed surgery. Picture G shows the periodontal surgical direct dressing that has been placed. And finally, picture H shows the surgical area three months after surgery. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about incisional surgery. Incisional surgery, also known as flap surgery, is performed when excisional surgery is not indicated. In flap surgery, tissues are not removed but are pushed away from underlying tooth roots and alveolar bone, similar to the flap of an envelope. After lifting the flap, the dentist may perform a thorough scaling and root planing of exposed root surfaces. He also may remove the flap to cover root surfaces of an adjacent tooth or recontour any underlying bone. Okay, let's talk about osseous 
uh, surgery, which is bone surgery. Osseous surgery is periodontal surgery that involves modification of the supporting bone. It is performed to eliminate pockets, remove defects, and restore normal contours to the bone. The two types of bone surgeries are osteoplasty and ostectomy. Osteoplasty or additive surgery, plasty means to add, contours and reshapes the bone. Bone may be added through bone grafting or the placement of artificial bone substitute materials, or it may be bone augmentation. Ostectomy or subtractive surgery is where bone is removed. Ectomy means to take away. This is done when a patient has large exotosis. Exotosis is another term for bony growth. Okay, so this slide shows pictures of osseous surgery. So picture A is a buccal preoperative photo showing two crowns and exotosis. Picture B shows the flap extracted to show a facial exotosis. Picture C uh, shows after osteo osseous uh, surgery uh, where the bulk of the bony removal has been form performed by osteoplasty with minor with a minor ostectomy uh, between the two molars. Picture D shows postoperative at six weeks. Crown lengthening is a surgical procedure that is designed to expose more tooth structure for the placement of a restoration such as a crown. It is a common procedure for aesthetics of anterior restorations. It also may involve the removal of soft tissue and alveolar bone. It also can be used uh, for a tooth that is fractured close to the gingival margin or the alveolar crest or for subgingival caries. It makes a supergingival area out of what was a subgingival area. Okay, so this is um, this slide shows um, pictures of crown lengthening. Um, picture A shows uh, before the crown lengthening. Picture B is the complete crown lengthening surgery. Picture C is the buccal view after surgery. And finally, picture D is the final restoration. Okay, let's talk about soft tissue grafts. There are two types, the pedicle graft and the free gingival soft tissue graft. The pedicle graft is used to move gingiva from a, an adjacent tooth or a dentulous area to a recipient site on another tooth. The pedicle graft is freed on three sides but remains attached on one side and retains its blood supply. The pedicle graft is best used for single site uh, recession for tooth for root coverage and for increasing the amount of attached gingiva. A free gingival soft tissue graft has a donor site that has that is located away from the um, needed site. Thus the blood supply is not attached to the graft and depends on the recipient site. The most common site for a donor tissue is the hard palate of the patient. Okay, let's talk about post-surgical instructions. After surgery, the periodontist will most likely prescribe an analgesic and possibly an antibiotic. He or she also will usually recommend an antibacterial rinse such as chlorhexidine twice a day to help with plaque control and to inhibit plaque formation during the early stages of healing. As a dental assistant, you will provide post-operative instructions to the patient for the patient's well-being and to comply with legal and ethical requirements. You can uh, look at page 860 in your textbook 
for these post-operative instructions. After surgery, a periodontal dressing, or periopac as it's commonly called, serves as a bandage over the surgical site. It is used to hold flaps in place, protect newly formed tissues, minimize post-operative pain, infection, and bleeding, protect the surgical site from trauma, and to support mobile teeth during the healing process. Um, there are two types of periodontal surgical dressings. Um, these dressing, dressings most often are made with zinc oxide eugenol or ZOE, and then, or they can be made without eugenol. There are several types um, of dressings available. A ZOE dressing is generally mixed at the time of a patient's appointment. It's, it is supplied as a powder and a liquid that is mixed before use. It has a slow set time, which allows for a longer working time. It also sets to a firm, heavy consistency and provides good protection. It is important to note some patients are allergic to eugenol in the ZOE dressing. Non-eugenol non dressing is the most common and widely used of the periodontal dressing. It comes in two tubes, a base and a catalyst. It is easy to mix and it usually takes two to three minutes to mix the paste. It is important to note that it has a rapid setting time if exposed to warm temperature. Unlike ZOE, it cannot be um, mixed in advance and stored. Okay, so let's talk about aesthetic and plastic periodontal surgery. Today, more and more general dentists are providing new aesthetic and cosmetic procedures. These include resin restorations, porcelain veneers and crowns, and dental implants. To do these types of procedures, the relationship between periodontal health and the restoration of teeth is critical. This involves making sure that the periodontum is healthy. And for the periodontum to be healthy, restorations must be properly designed in place. This means that the general dentist and periodontist must work closely together to provide optimum periodontal health and a focus on the aesthetics of and function of the restorations. Finally, let's look at lasers in periodontics. The use of lasers offers a promising new technology for dentistry. Laser is an acronym for light amplifications by simulated emission of radiation. It is a highly contracted beam of light. It can be adjusted to enable it to cut, vaporize, or cauterize tissue. Lasers are being marketed for a number of dental procedures involving both hard and soft tissues. These include removal of tumors and lesions, vaporizing excess tissues in gingivoplasty, gingivectomy, and phrenectomies, removal or reduction of hyperplastic enlarged tissues, and to control bleeding in vascular lesions. More widespread use of lasers in clinical dentistry is very likely. There are tremendous advantages to laser surgery over conventional surgery. Laser incisions heal faster. Bleeding can be tr controlled more rapidly. With lasers, the surgical field is relatively dry. Uh, there is a reduced um, blood-borne blood -borne contamination. Um, there's also fewer traumas to any adjacent tissues. Um, there's less post-surgical um, swelling, scarring, and pain. And some of these procedures can be performed more quickly than the conventional procedures. 
Also, patients who are afraid or reluctant to have surgery may be more acceptable or accepting of um, the use of lasers. Um, another big advantage is we may not need to anesthetize the patient prior to using um, the lasers. There are several different kinds of lasers with different precautions. You must be familiar with the precautions for the specific type of laser used. What are the guidelines for laser safety? First, both the patient and the dental staff must wear special shielded eyewear. Um, matte finished instruments should not be used because they can reflect the laser energy. Um, Non-oral tissues also must be shielded. Um, you should always use the HVE to draw off the plume or the cloud that's created when tissue vaporizes. Um, this plume is considered um, infectious. If you have any questions, you can email them to me or come to my office hours on Wednesday evening from 7 to 8 p.m.